Part 1 Frank Herbert's Dune All governments suffer a reoccurring problem. Power attracts pathological personalities. It is not that power corrupts, but that it is magnetic to the corruptible. Such people have a tendency to become drunk on violence, a condition to which they are quickly addicted. Frank Herbert, Chapter House, Dune Tacoma, Washington, October 8, 1920 Frank Herbert, creator of Dune, was born, the son of Frank Herbert Sr. and Eileen Herbert. In 1938, Frank Herbert left home to live with his aunt and uncle in Salem, Oregon. Frank Herbert began reading science fiction in the early 1940s, starting out with authors like Robert Heinlein, H.G. Wells, and Jack Vance. Frank Herbert was also personal friends with Jack Vance. They sailed around the Sacramento Delta together, along with Poole Anderson and a houseboat, which Jack Vance built. Frank Herbert began his writing career at the age of 19, after moving to Southern California and lying about his age to get a job with the Glendale Star. From then on, he would work for various newspapers as a journalist. In 1940, Frank Herbert would enter into his first marriage with Flora Parkinson, and in 1942, they would have a daughter together, Penny Herbert. However, this first marriage would end shortly after in 1945. In 1946... Frank Herbert then married Beverly Ann Stewart, and they would have two children together, Brian Herbert, born in 1947, and Bruce Calvin Herbert, born in 1951. Frank Herbert began writing science fiction in the early 1950s while he was living in Santa Rosa and working for the Press Democrat as a photojournalist. Some of his pre-Dune work was A Matter of Traces, 1958, and The Dragon in the Sea, 1956. Frank Herbert wanted to be a writer at a very early age, which he revealed in an interview in the 1973 issue of Vertex magazine, when asked what he was doing at the time when he decided to write fiction. I was a newspaper editor, but I was also writing fiction. I was writing short stories. I decided very early I was going to write fiction. I came down to my birthday breakfast on my 8th birthday and announced, formally and portentously, to my family that I was going to be an author. My mother still treasures several hand-scribbled, badly misspelled 8-year-old attempts at fiction. One of them doesn't have a bad lead on it. Even now, I can appreciate that I had the sense to put a narrative hook on the beginning of a story, even at age 8. While working as a journalist, an idea of a story would start to take shape in Frank Herbert's mind. It began with the idea of a messiah, or any great leader. Someone that comes along and convinces the masses to give up all their decision-making power to this person. What are the consequences of that decision? Frank Herbert explains. Personal observation has convinced me that in the power area of politics, economics, and their logical consequence, war. People tend to give over every decision-making capacity to any leader who can wrap himself in the myth fabric of the society. Hitler did it. Churchill did it. Franklin Roosevelt did it. Stalin did it. Mussolini did it. My favorite examples are John F. Kennedy and George Patton. Both fitted themselves into the flamboyant Camelot pattern, consciously assuming bigger-than-life appearance but the most casual observation reveals that neither was bigger than life. Each had our common human ailment, clay feet. That was the beginning. Heroes are painful. Superheroes are a catastrophe. The mistakes of superheroes involve too many of us in disaster. While this idea was evolving in Frank Herbert's mind, he went to Oregon to do a magazine article about the control of sand dunes. This would be the final ingredient he needed for his story, as he would reveal. While this concept was still fresh in my mind, I went to Florence, Oregon to write a magazine article about a U.S. Department of Agricultural project there. The USDA was seeking ways to control coastal and other sand dunes. I had already written several pieces about ecological matters, but my superhero concept filled me with the concern that ecology might be the next banner for demagogues and would-be heroes for the power seekers and others ready to find an adrenaline high in the launching of a new crusade. 
Starting in 1959, Frank Herbert devoted his full-time attention to researching and writing Dune. When his wife went back to work full-time as an advertising writer for department stores. The contributions of Beverly Herbert should not be overlooked. Not only did she work for many years and was the sole breadwinner so Frank Herbert could work on Dune, but she also helped him shape the material by acting as his editor. Dune was originally published in Analog Magazine in three parts, Dune World in 1963, The Prophet of Dune Part 2 and 3 in 1965. Frank Herbert attempted to get it published as a novel and was rejected by over 20 publishers, except for one. The Chilton Company, founded in 1904 and was most famous for its trade magazines and automotive manuals, seemed at first an unlikely place for what would turn out to be one of the greatest science fiction books ever written. Sterling E. Lanyer, who was an editor at the Chilton Book Company at the time, and a science fiction writer himself. Lanyer had read the Dune installments published in Analog Magazine, and wanted to publish all three together in a hardcover edition. Lanyer contacted Frank Herbert's agent, Lurton Lassengame. Lanyer offered a 7500 advance, plus future royalties, for the right to publish the analog installments. The deal was made. Lanyer pointed out there were several loose ends in the story and rough transition points between sections. Also, he wanted the work expanded, and when he discovered that Frank Herbert had drawn up a map of Dune, he wanted a copy included in the book. Lanyer also proposed that the title be simplified to Dune. Artist John Schooner was brought on to do the artwork, since he had done such an amazing job on the analog covers. Then, on August 1st, 1965, science fiction history was made. Frank Herbert's Dune was published. The story of Dune is set in the distant future of humanity that has changed into an interstellar society ruled by a feudal system, and great schools are devoted to the development of the human mind, with the most valuable resource being the spice melange, found only on one planet, Arrakis, otherwise known as Dune. The story revolves around young Paul Atreides, the son of Duke Leto, of House Atreides, and Paul's rise to power. Dune is a cautionary tale about what happens when people give up all their power to a perceived messiah. It deals with themes like the interplay between religion and politics, genetic and social engineering, humanity's relationship with the environment around them, and how their presence will affect that environment, also how that environment will affect them. When it comes to science fiction, Dune is as deep as it gets. After the success of the first novel, it was only natural there would be a sequel, and in 1969, Dune Messiah was published. The sequel would deal with the consequences from Paul's rise to power in the first book. Of all the Dune novels I've read, my favorite will always be the original. Its mysteries, Frank Herbert's writing style, the epic nature of the story, and all the cutthroat scheming between characters. With all its layers, there is always something new to find upon each reading of the book. With the Dune as a cemented success in the world of science fiction, with its incredible world building, deep characters and themes, it was only a matter of time before Hollywood came calling. Thank you to all of my subscribers, and thank you for watching this video. And if you're new to the channel, like, subscribe, and share. And don't forget to hit the bell icon for notification when new videos are uploaded.